Sumit, I think we'll start. People will keep yeah. going. Huh? Anytime you want. Already 14 or 15 yes. are there. I have no problem. Anytime yeah. you want. So we'll, be just... start. we'll start and keep... Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, we have uh, one of yeah. the rising stars or, or a big star of neurology, Dr. Sumit Singh. Uh, who has been a gold medalist from Allen Institute of Medical Sciences from 97-99 batch and uh, is one of our close friends and uh, part of the faculty of Neurology Part Seller. He is going to start. Uh, uh, start. Uh, as, yeah. Yeah. Any question? Uh, 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 no right. We'll start and keep a... Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, we have uh, one of yeah. the very... Uh, 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 who has been a gold medal from all in of medical sciences from 97-99 batch and uh, one of our close friends and uh, part of the faculty. We'll start and give a uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, today we have uh, one of our yeah. very Sumit, you start. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my screen is already shared. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the topic of double vision has been very close to my heart. And uh, I would uh, be discussing the eye movements even when I was in my MBBS. So I actually requested Dr. Gorthi if I could be permitted to discuss uh, my favorite topic with uh, my students. And I love to teach and Dr. Gorthi knows that. So we will be discussing about uh, uh, patients with the diplopia and the clinical approach to them. After this presentation, the attendee should be able to understand the functional neuroanatomy of the extraocular muscles, understand the eye movements and the muscles which cause those movements, the innervation of the extraocular muscles, have a knowledge of the ocular motor nerves in terms of their nuclei, their intracranial and intraneural courses and connections. And then finally, the approach to a patient with double vision in terms of localization for the site of the lesion and to some extent and type of the lesion. So the presentation flow would be reverse. So first we will be discussing about the third, fourth and sixth cranial nerve nuclei their interneural uh, uh, connections between the three nuclei, the intraneural cores of the ocular motor nerves, their intracranial cores, the entry point into the orbits, the intraorbital disposition and nerve supply of the extraocular muscles, the origin insertion relations and mechanisms of the extraocular muscles, their actions, diplopia charting, and then lesion localization. So the third nerve on ocular, uh, or the ocular motor nerve uh, is the largest of all the ocular motor nerves. It contains about 15,000 exons, including motor fibers and parasympathetic motor fibers. It's entirely motor in function, and it supplies also to the levator palpebris superioris and all extraocular muscles except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. It also supplies the intraocular muscles, namely the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscles. So these are the three functional components of this nerve, the somatic efferent component, which uh, supplies to the uh, extraocular muscles, the general visceral efferent, which is the parasympathetic supply to the ciliaris muscle and the sphincter pupillae, and the general somatic afferent, uh, which is associated with proprioceptive impulses from the extraocular muscles supplied by the somatic efferent component of this nerve. The ocular motor nuclear complex is a complicated uh, conglomeration of several subnuclei, which are in the midbrain at the upper level of the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus. 
and these are the various nuclei in a rostrocaudal direction. So in the rostral caudal uh, uh, direction, there is a disposition of these nuclei. So if we cut these nuclei like this, the picture is going to be something like this. And when we do a vertical resection of the brain, then this is what we are going to see roughly. So in the rostral most is the Edinga westfall nucleus and the caudal most is the nucleus for the medial rectus. The inferior rectus, the superior rectus, the inferior oblique and the posterior nuclei, which is the central caudal nucleus is the other component. Now it is important to understand that some of these nuclei are paired like the inferior rectus, the superior rectus nuclei are paired nuclei. Whereas the Edinga westfall nucleus and the central caudal nuclei are unpaired nuclei. So this is a blank slide and on this I will draw roughly the distribution of the various nuclei. So the superior rectus nucleus is a paired nucleus. The Edinga westfall nucleus is a singer nucleus. The, nu the subnucleus for the levator palpebris superioris is a single nucleus. The inferior rectus, the <coughs> inferior oblique and the medial rectus nuclei are all paired nuclei. Now it is important to understand that the superior rectus nucleus decussates at the nuclear level to supply to the opposite side. So the right superior rectus generates fibers which cross over to the other side superior rectus and go down. Similarly, the, there is a cross connection from the other side. So what is important to understand that you can't have a unilateral Edinger westfall nucleus or a pupillary involvement by a nuclear pathology. You can't have a one-sided superior rectus palsy by a nuclear involvement. And you can't have a unilateral ptosis by the levator palpebrae superioris nucleus because they are practically unpaired nuclei. Now, all these other nuclei, they form fibers which come out and then they form the fascicle of the nerve as they keep on coming out. Pulses. If there is a fascicular involvement, um, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So there is possible that you can have a one-sided nerve, one-sided muscle palsy by a fascicular lesion, but it is not possible to have one-sided muscle palsy by a nuclear lesion involving the pupils, the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus. So if it is a nuclear lesion, all these three have to be bilateral. The fascicular portion of the ocular motor nerve descends as it moves uh, ventrally and laterally to the mesencephalon. The vesicles, the fascicles, they pass through the medial longitudinal fascicles, the red nucleus and the medial portion of the cerebral peduncle. During the passage through the ventral midbrain, there is a topographical organization of the fascicles. So you can see that these fascicles are distributed as they come out and they are separated apart only when they are about to exit, they tend to relatively join together to form some sort of a nerve fiber. So if you have a lesion here, which is a small, say, a lacunar infarct or maybe a small uh, 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 space occupying pathology, it is possible that one of these vesicles of the nerve might be affected. And as these fibers, they come out, the pupillary fibers are the literal most and the inferior rectus fibers are the medial most. And as the nerve exits the brain stem, it comes into the interpeduncular fossa as a horizontal arrangement of multiple fiber bundles that rapidly coalesce to form the subarachnoid portion of the third cranial nerve. So this is at the time when, when they come out here, it is a flat nerve with one fibers of the pupil which are here and the inferior rectus which are here. But as it comes out, it, when it comes out, it is in the form of several uh, rootlets. They coalesce to form a large medial and a small literal root, which then unite to form, as I told you, a flattened nerve, which gets twisted so that the inferior most fibers, they come up and the superior fibers, they come down. So there is a twisting of the entire nerve when it comes out. 
and it passes between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery to run forward in the interpeduncular cistern parallel with the posterior communicating artery. So that is why whenever you have an aneurysm of any of these arteries, there is a very early involvement of the third nerve. Why it is important to understand these pupillary fibers and the fascicular distribution and the formation of the nerve is because if there is an external compressive pathology, then the pupillary fibers will be affected the first because they are superficial most as the nerve comes out of the brainstem. And then they tend to migrate towards the center as the nerve goes forward. So if there is a compressive pathology, pupillary fibers will be affected first. On the contrary, if there is an involvement of the vasum nervosum, like a vascular pathology, then the pupillary fibers may be spared. So this is the distribution of the nerve. As it, this is the nucleus. It is coming out. And as it is coming out, it is passing between the superior cerebellar and the posterior cerebral artery. It goes down and then it pierces the posterior superior component of the cavernous sinus on its lateral wall, and then it enters it. And this is running parallel to the posterior communicating artery. And this is the third nerve as it is being formed. Then we come to the second nerve, which is the fourth nerve. Now, this is the only nerve which emerges on the dorsal side of the brainstem. So this is the, <clears throat> this is the trochlear nerve nucleus, which is at the inferior colliculus level. The fibers, they run posteriorly and they emerge out on the dorsal side and they cross over to the opposite side. So when they cross over to the opposite side, again, there is a contralateral innervation of the superior oblique muscle. The, <clears throat> the fourth nerve will be divided into four portions, the fascicular, the precavernous, the intracavernous, and the intraorbital part. So these fibers from the nucleus, they uh, emerge out, they run posteriorly, circulate around the periaqueductal gray matter. They emerge on the side of the anterior medullary vellum, which is here. They decussate and emerge on the contralateral side. And then they wind around the uh, midbrain to emerge on the anterior side. From the superior medullary vellum, they wind around this frenulum villi. This is the frenulum villi area. On the dorsal aspect of the midbrain, they wind around the cerebral peduncle and uh, the, emerge between the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar arteries just below the third nerve lateral to the cerebral peduncle and pierce the posterior corner of the roof of the cavernous sinus. So this is the fourth nerve. Now the fourth nerve paralysis is extremely unusual in isolation. Almost always it will either be congenital or it will be because of lesions in the posterior fossa or it will be post-traumatic. Post-traumatic is the commonest cause for trochlear nerve palsy in uh, all the cases of fourth nerve palsies. The sixth nerve is the adducent nerve. Uh, it contains three types of neurons, the adducent motor neurons, which are supplying to the ipsilateral rect lateral rectus muscle. Then there would be adducent internuclear neurons, which supply to the contralateral medial rectus subnucleus through the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And then there would be neurons that project to the cerebellar flocculus, which are important for the supranuclear control of the horizontal eye movements. So in the central course, the abducens nerve cycles, they course entero-inferiorly through the pontine tegmentum, adjacent to the facial nerve and exit the brainstem at the pontomedullary sulcus. So this is the, this is the sixth nerve uh, nucleus and these fibers, they emerge anteriorly. The facial nerve is enterolateral. The nucleus of the facial nerve is enterolateral to the abducens nerve nucleus and it winds around the internal nucleus uh, uh, the of uh, it winds around the nucleus of the abducens nerve and this is called as the internal genu and it emerges on the lateral aspect of the pontine tegmentum so whenever you have a nuclear pathology there is a strong possibility that there might be an associated facial nerve involvement also in the intracranial course, the sixth nerve has got its longest intracranial uh, you know, pathway. It has a cisternal segment, a petroclival segment, the cavernous segment, and the orbital segment. 
and it then passes through the Dorello's canal as a, which is an osteofibrous conduit located at the level of the petrous apex through which the adjacent nerve courses to reach the cavity of the cavernous sinus. So this is the area of uh, the, 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 the cisternal segment, the petroclival segment and the cavernous segment, which is on the lateral side. Now, what is important say so that if we cut a horizontal, a vertical or a coronal section of the, of the petrous bone, then it is almost like a triangular bone. The pons is somewhere in the lower side in the posterior fossa. So the cranial nerve, this is the sixth cranial nerve has to go superiorly and then arc over the apex of the petrous temporal. So whenever there are intracranial pathologies, which are associated with a increased intracranial tension, then there is a brain uh, uh, herniation. So it tends to arc over the sharp edges of the uh, petrous uh, uh, apex. And that is why whenever there are features of raised intracranial pressure, it is the sixth nerve, which gives lo false localization signs at the earliest. Now, all these nerves, they enter finally into the cavernous sinus. So this is the, what this is, this is basically a, a coronal section of the cavernous sinus in its middle. The disposition of nerves. So if we take the cavernous sinus like a anteroposterior distribution, so it is going to be somewhere like this. So when we cut the posterior part first, the things will be different. In the middle, they will be different. And in the anterior most part, they will be different. So we, the middle portion is the most representative because all the nerves are presently seen at the middle part. So this is the pituitary gland, the optic chiasma. This is the internal carotid artery, which tends to form a carotid siphon in this way. So this is how the carotid artery tends to wind around itself in the uh, cavernous sinus. So whenever you are going to cut it coronally, you will be able to see at least the, uh, the carotid artery twice. It is surrounded by a sympathetic plexus all around it. On the lateral wall, you will be able to see the oculomotor nerve. You'll be able to see the trochlear nerve. You'll be able to see the abducens nerve, which when it enters the cavernous sinus, it is lateral. When it is in the middle part of the cavernous sinus, it is just abutting the internal carotid artery. And then when it leaves in the anterior part of the cavernous sinus, it tends to dissociate itself with the from the carotid artery. And then you have the, the fifth nerve, the ophthalmic division, the mandibular division and the maxillary division of the fifth cranial nerve. So this is a diagrammatic representation of the cavernous sinus when we cut through it coronally. So these are the three portions, as I told you, this is the posterior most part, this is the middle part, and this is the anterior most part of the cavernous sinus. So when we are the posterior most, you can see all the cranial nerves, they are in the process of entering. And the distance between the abducens nerve and the internal carotid artery is a little more. But when we are in the middle part, the internal carotid artery is in close proximity with the abducens nerve and the other nerves are on the lateral side of the wall of the cavernous sinus. And then again, this is just before they tend to enter into the superior or vital fissure where you can see that the internal carotid artery in its anterior most part is being cut so that we can see a very large loop of it. So as I've already told you, all the three nerves, they enter the cavernous sinus by piercing the posterior parts of its roof, the lateral side of the posterior clinard process. They descend to the lateral wall, particularly the third, fourth and sixth nerves in that particular order. And as I have told you that as we continue to enter into the cavernous sinus, there is a change in the disposition of the cavernous of the cranial nerves inside it. This is when these nerves, they enter into the superior or vital fissure. So the optic nerve is in the center of the tendinous ring of Zinn. So this is the tendinous ring of Zinn. This is the region of the various uh, uh, extraocular muscles and their disposition I will come to you are shortly. Just a minute. I'm sorry. I...
Yeah. So uh, the, uh, this is the origin of the extraocular muscles, which I'll tell you. So in the middle part, the third and the fourth nerves are there and there is the nasociliary nerve. The superior and the inferior division of the third nerve, it tends to divide just as it enters into the superior orbital fissure. The fourth nerve <coughs> is, so this is the left one. So this is the medial part. The fourth nerve is in the medial part of it and along with the frontal and the lacrimal nerve. And the, the medial part or the medial most part, which is the inferior segment of this uh, superior orbital fissure has got infraorbital nerve and uh, some arteries. So this is the distribution of the cranial nerves as they enter. So now if the lesion is involving multiple cranial nerves, then the localization has to be in the superior orbital fissure region or in the anterior or the middle part of the, the, the cavernous sinus. If you have multiple ocular motor nerve palsies and you have a ophthalmic division involvement of the trigeminal nerve, the lesion has to be in the anterior most part of the cavernous sinus or in the superior orbital fissure region. If the lesion is in the cavernous sinus itself, then you will have multiple ocular motor nerve palsies. You will have maxillary nerve, in, or mendi, uh, maxillary nerve involvement and a ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve involvement. The mandibular nerve will be spared because it leaves the cavernous sinus just on the posterior most edge. So this is how we tend to roughly localize whenever multiple cranial nerves are being affected in the same patient. Uh, this I think I have already covered the, the intraorbital part of the third nerve. Uh, so it divides into a superior and a inferior division. Uh, the smaller division is the superior division and the larger division is the inferior division. Uh, they further subdivide into uh, branches depending upon uh, which nerve they supply. So the inferior division supplies to the medial rectus, the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique. The inferior oblique branch is the longest most. The smaller superior division supplies to the superior rectus and the levator palpebrae superioris. So this is the distribution of uh, the superior orbital fissure and the various recti muscles. Again, uh, a, a diagrammatic representation of the same thing. The internuclear connections are important. So this is the internuclear disposition. So the fibers of the abducens nerve, they are divided into two, a medial part, which ascends through the medial longitudinal fasciculus and supplies to the a portion of the oculomotor nucleus, which supplies to the medial rectus. So this basically results in the conjugate movement of the eye is uh, together so the one when one side lateral rectus causes the abduction of the eye the other side medial rectus co-contracts and it causes the adduction of the eye so now we come to the extraocular muscles their functional neuroanatomy and their uh, actions and relations so the orbital muscles are divided into intraocular and the extraocular sites the intraocular ones are the ciliary muscles the extraocular ones could be involuntary, which is the superior and the inferior tarsal, and the extraocular voluntary muscles are the LPS, the four uh, superior, inferior, medial, lateral recti, and the two obliques, the superior and the inferior oblique muscles. So this is the distribution of all the nerves and all the muscles in the orbit region. So let's trace one by one. <clears throat> so this is the third nerve. It goes, it straps from the midbrain, upper portion goes down, divides into two parts and supplies to the muscles, as I've already told you. This is the trochlear nerve, which arises from the posterior part and the, we have discussed its distribution and it supplies to the superior uh, oblique. And this is the sixth nerve, which is supplying to the lateral rectus muscle. Mm -hmm. Yes, so now we come to the uh, uh, origin and the insertion of these muscles. So this is the tendinous ring of Zinn. And this tendinous ring of Zinn, uh, the levator palpebrae superioris, the superior rectus, the superior oblique, the medial rectus, the lateral rectus, and the inferior rectus, they all arise from the tendinous ring of Zinn. Now, uh, I'll stop uh, this sharing.
for some time and then i will show you something can you focus on me please you can click on my camera so that you can understand i have made a model so you will have to enlarge my visual so this is the model of uh, the eyeball and this is uh, how it is disposed inside the orbit so the ocular axis is anteroposterior and the orbital axis is at 27 degree to the ocular axis so they are not aligned in their neutral positions so what is important to understand is that the superior rectus and the inferior rectus they are in alignment with the orbital axis and not the ocular axis i will draw that diagram and i will show you again similarly the superior obliques and the inferior obliques are not the muscles which act from their points of origin straight away they act in a slightly different way so i will share my screen again and i'll try to draw it and then i will show you uh put it on slide show also yeah i'm doing that is it visible now yeah excellent excellent okay so this is the rough diagrammatic representation of the orbits so the orbital axis is like this and the ocular axis is like this so there is roughly a 27 degree angle between these two the superior rectus which arises from the tendinous ring of zin runs laterally and it is in line with the it's in line with the orbital axis similarly the inferior rectus is also like this the lateral rectus and the medial rectus do not need any special manifestation because they have only a single movement so they move the eye medially for the medial rectus and laterally for the lateral rectus they don't need any special mention beyond this now the superior oblique is important in the sense that it arises from the wing of the sphenoid hair it runs anteriorly and it winds around the trochlear pulley and it goes posteriorly and is inserted behind the equator so if this is the eyeball the superior oblique runs like this and is inserted posterior to the equator which means that when it will contract its action will not be from its point of origin it will be from the point of its diversion so its point of artificial origin would be considered as the trochlear pulley so when it contracts it will be in this direction that it will cause a movement similarly the inferior oblique also is something like this so it is also inserted into the postero inferior quadrant behind the equator so these muscles are different in the sense that they do not cause a direct movement of the eyeball they cause a indirect movement of the eyeball so once we have understood this distribution of the superior recti inferior recti the superior oblique and the inferior oblique then we go further towards their movement so if we want to understand the eye movements then there are you will have to see my uh, is this uh, visible uh, shall i focus you yes if it is good if we can yeah i'll focus is it visible sir one second one second one second uh, yeah it's visible yeah so now you will see that whenever you look at the movement of the eyes you have to understand it like a sphere and whenever there is a sphere the possible movements can be several but the primary axis of movements can only be three one can be an antero posterior axis in which there is going to be in torsion which means that the superior angle or the superior edge of the eyeball is moving medially 
or extortion in which it moves laterally. The second movement can be around a transverse axis in which the eyeball moves upwards or it moves downwards. And the third movement can be adduction and abduction. Of course, there can be a combination of these movements also. Uh, so you will have to, um, I think, uh, uh, reduce your share screen of the slides. Keep no problem. Up. No problem. We can do that. Not a problem. Okay. Yeah, now it's okay. Is it clear now? Is it okay? I now will repeat it again. Students, are you able to uh, see now? Just reply. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Right. Okay. So on yes, the anterior posterior axis, the superior edge of the eyeball moves medially is in torsion. When it moves laterally, it is extortion. When it moves up, it is elevation. When it moves down, it is depression. And then there is medial movement, which is adduction, and the lateral movement, which is abduction. So these are the six primary movements which one should be concerned. Of course, there can be several types of movements also. Now we will look at these movements in terms of the muscles affected. So the superior rectus is something like this. The inferior rectus is something like this. The superior oblique is coming from this side and is inserted in the posterior superior quadrant the inferior oblique is coming from down and is inserted in the posterior inferior quadrant. So now once we understand and imagine the situation of these muscles, we can understand the eye movements better. So in a neutral position, when the eye is looking anteroposteriorly, the ocular axis, which means the axis of the eye and the orbital axis are misaligned. So when the eye is abducted, the ocular axis and the orbital axis, they become the same. And in this position, the superior rectus is a primary elevator of the eye. And the inferior rectus is a primary depressor of the eye. Is it clear? So in a neutral position, we don't examine these movements. When we work up these patients or examine them, they always are examined in the way which I am telling you. So you ask the patient to abduct the eye because in this position, the orbital and the ocular axis will be aligned. The superior rectus will be primary elevator of the eye. The inferior rectus will be a primary depressor of the eye. But in this abducted position, the superior oblique, which was coming like this, it is coming from the anterior side and it's been inserted in the posterior superior quadrant. So the superior oblique will be in torting the eye and the inferior oblique, which is inserted in the posterior inferior quadrant will be in extorting the eye. Is it clear? Yeah. That's if, I will repeat it again hmm. because this is the single most part which you have to understand. You have understood the cranial nerve nuclei. You have understood that transmission you have understood the superior orbital fissure. Now you have to understand the mechanics of the movement of the eyeballs. And that is how it works. So in an abducted position, the orbital and the ocular axes are aligned. So the superior rectus, which is like this, is a primary elevator of the eye. The inferior rectus is a primary depressor of the eye. Superior oblique, which is like this, is a intorter of the eye. And the inferior oblique is a extorter of the eye. Is it clear? When the eye becomes in an adducted position, things completely reverse. So now the superior oblique and the inferior oblique are now in the direction of the ocular axis. So the superior oblique, which was inserted here, is a depressor of the eye because when it contracts, it will pull the anterior angle downwards. 
So this is going to be the direction of pull of the superior oblique. So the superior oblique will be a primary depressor of the eye. The inferior oblique will be a primary elevator of the eye. The superior rectus, which is now in this direction, will be an intorter of the eye. And the inferior rectus will be an extorter of the eye. So there is a complete reversal of the superior and inferior oblique. And the superior and inferior rectus muscle activity in the abducted and the adducted position. In the entire eye movements, all you have to remember is this. If you remember this, you already know which nerve is supplied in which muscle, and you will be able to understand the double vision evaluation in a much better fashion. So again, I'm repeating. In the abducted position, the superior rectus elevates, inferior rectus depresses, superior oblique intorts, inferior oblique extorts. In an adducted position, the superior oblique depresses, the inferior oblique elevates, the superior rectus intorts, and the inferior rectus extorts the eye. Is it clear? Now we come to the presentation again. So whenever you examine, you always take the right eye as a reference eye. And this is how is the distribution of the various muscles. So you can see that the superior rectus is in this direction. Uh, Sumit, so slideshow. Yeah. So you can see that this is the orbit ocular axis. And this is the orbital axis. So in an abducted position, abducted position, both these axes will be together. So the superior rectus, which is running like this, will pull this angle up. So the eye will be elevated. The inferior rectus is below. So it will pull the eye down. It will be depressed. But in this position, where the pupil is somewhere here, the superior oblique is at 90 degrees. So when it contracts, because it is in the posterior quadrant, it will intort the eye and the inferior oblique will extort the eye. This is a, a diagrammatic representation of the same thing. I don't think I need to repeat it. And this is, again, as I told you, that this is the point of action of the superior oblique muscle. And this is the point of action of the both inferior rectus and the superior rectus muscle. So when it is adapted, the superior oblique elevates and inferior oblique depresses, uh, sorry, superior oblique depresses and inferior oblique elevates the eye. So this is for your understanding purposes. So we don't have to confuse ourselves with the primary motion, the secondary motion, the tertiary motion. Our important issue is that what is the primary action of the superior and inferior rectus muscle in abducted position and adducted position? And what is the primary action of the superior and inferior oblique in adducted position and in abducted position? That is the only four movements you have to understand. And that solves your puzzle of double vision completely. So now I will move this I think we'll leave. So I'll be uh, stopping my share again, sir. And I'll be again coming to the model yeah. to understand things better. Right. So now we are going to have a binocular movement discussion. So this is the right eye. And this is the left eye. And this is the position of the eyeballs. Now my eyes are in abducted position and I'm taking the reference of the right eye. In the abducted position, the superior rectus will elevate the eye. But when this eye is abducted, this eye is adducted. All right. So in this case, the left eye 
the superior oblique will be depressing the eye and the inferior oblique will be elevating the eye. So same side rectus means opposite side, opposite oblique. So if this is the motion we are talking, right side superior rectus and left side inferior oblique are the muscles which are causing this movement. Am I clear? Yes. Again repeating, in abducted position of the right eye, the superior rectus of the right eye will be elevating and the inferior oblique of the left eye will be elevating the eyeball. So right side rectus, left sided opposite oblique. So this movement of both the eyes conjugate would be by the right superior rectus and left inferior oblique. In the abducted position, the right sided superior oblique will be entorting the eye and the left sided inferior oblique will be entorting the eye. Is it clear? The right eye inferior rectus will be depressing the eye and the left eye superior oblique will be depressing the eye. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So now we will... Please just tell this again, sir. No problem. So this is your right eye. This is your left eye. When the right eye is abducted, the left eye is adapted. We discussed that in an abducted position, the superior rectus elevates the eye. And in the adapted position, the inferior oblique elevates the eye. Isn't it? We discussed it. Somebody of you will answer. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay. So now when this eye is abducted, this eye is adapted. So in this abducted position, this eye, superior rectus will elevate the eye. And on this side, the inferior oblique will be doing the same action. Is it yes, clear? Sir. Similarly, when the right eye is adducted, yes, the superior oblique will be depressing the eye. Yes. But here side, the eye is abducted. So the superior rectus will be doing the same action. That's why I'm saying, same side rectus, opposite side oblique. So in this eye, the elevation in abducted position was caused by superior rectus. In this eye, the same action would be caused by opposite side, opposite oblique, which means inferior oblique. So all you have to remember is in the right eye, in the abducted position, Elevation is caused by the superior rectus muscle. Only this thing you remember. Now, one by one, we can discuss. Right eye, abducted position, elevation caused by superior rectus. Left eye, adducted position, elevation caused by inferior. inferior. Right side, adducted position, Elevation caused by inferior, inferior oblique. Inferior. Left side, abducted position, elevation caused by superior rectus. Right eye, abducted position, intorsion caused by superior oblique. Left eye, adducted position, intorsion caused by inferior oblique. Right eye, adducted position, depression caused by superior oblique. Superior oblique, elevation caused by inferior oblique. Left eye, abducted position, elevation caused by superior rectus, depression caused by inferior rectus. Is it clear? Yes. Uh, answer, uh, students. <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now we will share the this thing to coming to the crux of approaching these patients. <coughs> So whenever you have a patient with double vision, the first question you ask is, do you have double vision? Answer would be yes or no. The second question would be, is this double vision binocular or uniocular? Which means what happens when you close one eye? If the patient says 
that my double vision persists even when I close one eye, the lesion cannot be in the nerves or in the extraocular muscles. The lesion has to be in the lens or in the cortex. Because what happens is that if the lens gets displaced from the pupillary area, a part of the light, suppose this is the lens and it has displaced, then part of the light will go through the area where there is no lens and a part of the light will go from an area which is having the lens so it will be refracted. So the eye will see double even if there is one eye being affected. So the only ways by which you can uni have uniocular diplopia is by uh, dislocation or subluxation of the lens or it could be a lesion in the cortex or it could be functional. There can be no third possibility. So if the patient says <clears throat> that, no, I have binocular diplopia, which means that when I close one eye, my double vision goes away. So then you will ask, okay, you have a double vision. Now, when you see double images, both of the images are of the same quality or one of them is blurred or poor. So always remember, poor means paretic and sharp means sound. So the poor image always belongs to the paretic muscle and the sound image always, uh, you know, uh, belongs to the sound eye. Now, if there are two images, the poor image will always be from the paretic eye and it will always be towards the periphery. So P for P for P. Poor image, paretic eye towards the periphery. And sound image, sharp image, sorry, sound eye, sharp image, and it will be towards the patient. Away from the patient will be poor image, away from the patient will be from the paretic eye, away from the patient will be the, uh, the paretic muscle. Then the next question should be, are these, mus are these images separated horizontally? So if these are the two images, are they separated horizontally or there is a vertical displacement, which means one image is lower and the upper image is down. Now, what you do is that you ask the patient to move the eyes in the maximum separation of images up and down. And then you ask what happens. So he will say that my images come closer or they become more separated apart. So if you are moving your hand or the image producer in the direction of action of the paralyzed muscle, the images will move further apart. So we have come to understand that if there is a horizontal separation of the muscle, of the images, either the lateral rectus or the medial rectus are going to be at fault. If there is a vertical separation of the images, any of the superior rectus, inferior rectus, superior oblique or inferior oblique are at fault. So suppose the patient says that when I look towards the right, I see double, but when I look towards the left, I see single. So the possibility is only two. One is that the right lateral rectus or the left medial rectus is at fault because abduction of the right eye is caused by right lateral rectus and adduction of the left eye is caused by left medial rectus. So now you will find that when we move the eye towards the right side, the images become further apart. Now you close one eye. Suppose you close the right eye and the patient says that the sharper image has gone. It means that the lesion is on the left side. And we know that the adduction of the left eye was caused by medial rectus. And therefore, the medial rectus on the left side is at fault. The right side is okay. And we know that the medial rectus is supplied by the third cranial nerve. So we look at our topography of the nerves from where they are traveling and arising, and we can localize that lesion to that particular area. 
Suppose the patient says that when I move my eyes to the right side, I see double. And when you close my right eye, the poor image goes away. That means the lesion is in the right eye, in the lateral rectus muscle, which is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. And we again remember the origin and the course of the third nerve, so we can again localize the lesion. So the medial and the lateral rectus muscles are the easiest ones to do. But it the confusion starts when the superior and the inferior rectus and the, uh, and the <coughs> inferior oblique and the superior oblique are at fault. So for that, we have to again remember what happens, how it happens, and how we work it out. So let's look at a diplopia chart. So what we can do is we can make a double colored goggle. So in the front of the right eye, you put in a, a red paper. And on the left eye, you, you put in a green paper. So the patient, when he has double vision, he knows that the red image is gone or the green image is gone. Otherwise, for an intelligent patient, it is also okay if you uh, tell them that the poor image goes or the better image goes. So now what we do is that we ask the patient to say, for example, look towards the right side. I am again stop sharing and now you will look towards me. So now this is the neutral position of the eyes. Now I am asking the patient the patient says that I see double. Then you say what happens when you close the left eye. He says, I see one. Then you will again ask, now you close your right eye, what happens? I see one. But when I open both the eyes, I see two. Now, the second question you say is, are these both images same or one of them is sharper and the other is poor? He will say, no, one is sharp, one is poor. Now you will say, are they both together or one of them is towards the periphery, one is towards the center. He says, no, one is towards the periphery. Now you move your eyes or the patient's eyes in the direction of the action of that particular muscle. So suppose he says, when I look towards the right, I see double. When I look towards the left, I see single. Okay. Now are the images when you look towards the right, horizontally separated or vertically separated? He says, no, they are vertically separated. We have already discussed the horizontal component. So no, they are vertically separated. Okay. So when... Excuse me. I'm in a meeting, by So... Uh, now you will say that when I look right, the images are vertically separated. So in an abducted position of the right eye, the patient says that the images are vertically separated. Now I ask him to look up and then I look down. Now he says, when I look up on the right side, the images become separate further. And when I look down, the images come closer. So we know that in this direction, this movement is caused by superior right rectus. superior rectus and the left inferior oblique. Is it clear? Somebody of you has to answer. Yes, sir. Okay. So in this right direction on an elevation, if the images are separated further apart and they become closer, then the only muscles which can be at fault is right superior rectus or left inferior oblique. Now you close, say, the right eye. And he says, on closing my right eye, the sharp image has gone, which means the lesion is on the left side. And we know that in the left eye, the elevation was caused by the inferior oblique. So we know that the lesion is affecting the inferior oblique on the left eye. Suppose he says, that on looking towards the right, when I close the right eye, my poor image goes. Then the lesion is on the right side in the muscle which causes elevation of the right eye in abducted position, which is the superior rectus. Superior rectus. So the lesion is on the right side in the superior rectus. So now 
we have to do a diplopia charting and somebody will answer questions looking towards the right looking down images are separated the most when i close my left eye the sharp image goes away where is the lesion uh, right inferior rectus right inferior rectus so you've got it in adducted position of the right eye when the patient looks up the images are maximum separated when i close the left eye the sharp image goes away where is the lesion right inferior oblique fantastic so this is basically the crux of understanding the eye movements and the targeting of understanding which particular muscle is affected so once you have understood which muscle is affected you also know i'm sharing the screen again so once you know that which muscle is affected you already have information that this muscle is supplied by this nerve this nerve originates from there and that is where i am going to localize my lesion so if you feel that there is a single nerve palsy or a single muscle palsy where can the lesion be in a single muscle palsy the lesion can only be in the midbrain or it can be in the orbit itself because everywhere else you know right when they come out of the brain stem when they enter into the cavernous sinus when they come out from the superior orbital fissure all these nerves are so close together that a involvement of a single muscle is practically impossible so only when the fascicles in the brain stem or when the nerve fibers or the nerve branches in the orbit are affected you can have a single muscle palsy otherwise you will always have multiple muscles being involved because it is going to be a full cranial nerve which is going to be at fault if you find that the third fourth nerves are affected together you know that lesion can be only in the superior orbital fissure or in the middle or the anterior part of the cavernous sinus if you have associated features like say one sided hemiparesis and then a nuclear complete third or a partial third nerve palsy we know that there are long track signs the lesion is in the brain stem so in order to understand the the pathogenesis of double vision and the localization of the lesion the most important part is to understand the anatomy of the brain stem the nuclear disposition of the fibers the 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 clinical course and the relations of the various ocular motor nerves and then the mechanics of the movement of the eyes once you have understood this and you identify which muscle is affected you can very easily do a localization of the lesion thank you very much for your kind attention oh excellent uh, uh, with the same uh, principle supply for skew deviation yes Sumit. So no skew deviation will be different because different. there there the lesion has to be supra orbital i'm just looking at the double vision i'm not discussing the supra orbital eye movements we can discuss that any other time hey sumit i want to show them the uh, double colored uh, glasses which we used when we were in yes, yes, yes. that would be very great sir so uh, shall you will you just show the uh, i'm stopping the share here yeah, yeah so i'll show you them Yes. And, uh, Sir, I have to make one phone call. Just give me ten seconds. In the meantime, I will show them the glasses. Uh, students, uh, what Dr. Sumit was saying is that what we practiced. I don't know whether you are able to see, but very dark because of the rain here. Uh, one side of the lenses, you have to have a dark glass of red color. The other one is green color. when you put this glasses on the eyes you can uh, find the two different colored images so that will help in the uh, diplopia evaluation and uh, sumit has really taken an excellent uh, class so what are your questions and i think there are some questions have come up we'll see uh, uh, maybe a wrong demand can we get this ppt and uh, actually you know you can see this class on uh, uh, youtube and uh, we have made it live so that 
फोटोग्राफर and an artist that's where so these diagrams are all made by me i know that that's yeah. what i'm saying that you done excellent and uh, anybody wants to ask anything the time before sumit leaves uh they say that uh, the excellent class sir and uh, they are very happy about the class sumit will uh, will have you again will will our faculty will again decide when to have a class and what topic will have any what any time sir any time you want my special area of interest would be something on headache hmm. this is you know my forte yeah. anything on related to movement disorders anything related to myasthenia neuromuscular disorders and uh, supranuclear control of eye movements and yes, cognition sim- cognition yes, sim- cognition any time you want you know we will uh, this batch of 97 99 Of all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences will carry forward the neuro hepat cell or if and we'll plan and the uh, any time you want, sir. I'm at your disposal completely. Thank you very much. Shall we? Say okay. Bye? Thanks, students. I love to teach, so I <laughs> I might have been o- overboard because it is after a long time that I'm taking actually a class for the students. So Excellent they want dementia also and they want dementia also. So we'll no plan. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent class. Right, right. Ah, okay, Damija sir. sir is saying excellent oh, class. Oh my God! Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So nice yeah. of you, sir. So it's very nice to hear you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you Good. very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and we'll carry forward. Okay, sir.